Good morning, everybody. Um, this is Aleda Bossov speaking. You can't see me today because I've got um, issues with my webcam and I've actually decided it's a good thing because I also have um, conjunctivitis in my eyes. So I'm not looking pretty. So the webcam picked that up. Um, so that's the good news. However, Kevin is still uh, fit and healthy and therefore he's on camera. Good morning, Kevin. Good morning, Aleta, and I'm sorry to hear you're not well, um, but I'm glad to hear you're still up and kicking. Um, welcome, everybody, to our August <laughs> webinar. And Aleta, it's good to hear your voice again. Yeah, no, fantastic, and it's lovely to see you. Uh, to all our regular um, or, um, or new attendees, welcome to this month's IFRS webinar. Um, this month, we're looking at the increased complexity when accounting for convertible notes. Um, and Kevin will be really talking about the convertible notes part and share some insights. But this is something that we're seeing more and more of, especially in the current um, in economic environment. Um, so I think a very timely one. Also, I know a lot of our clients are currently grappling with accounting for convertible notes in their 30 June 2023 financial statements again maybe some uh, food for thought for you today. <laughs> so the two presenters, as always, um, Kevin is joining me from Sydney. Actually, Kevin is the key presenter at, um, in today's webinar. Uh, we would also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. Um, for me in Melbourne, it is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And we want to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And we also extend that respect to Aboriginal <coughs> and Torres Strait Islander peoples that are attending today. So before I hand over to Kevin to talk about convertible notes and all the fun stuff, um, just a reminder on the focus for 30 June 2023 reporting. Um, now, as you know, over recent months, there's been a lot of developments around sustainability reporting, <clears throat> and a lot of people are saying, so yes, there's a new IFRS S1, S2. Um, yes, Australian government has come up with a treasury consultation paper about mandatory reporting dates, but what do we do for 30 June 2023 reporting? I think the answer is twofold. One is to still focus on the TCFD recommendations that are already published, already effective, strongly encouraged by ASIC in media releases, and we've seen um, some recent um, media uh, re releases around this, but also <coughs> start with measuring your carbon footprint and potentially disclosing at a minimum, your scope one and scope two carbon footprint, which is one of the recommendations or, um, or disclosure recommendations of the TCFD recommendations. A lot of people are asking, so how can I find out more about the TCFD? Uh, so we've got an e-learning course that you can work through uh, to get an idea what it is. Um, by the way, I think the most common question that I'm being asked at the moment is, should I look at TCFD training and TCFD checklists and TCFG disclosures, or should I already pay attention to IFRS S2, which is replacing TCFD? Um, I think at this stage, it's really good to keep your eye on the TCFD recommendations because it will set you up for success when you transition to IFRS S2. It's a very good stepping stone. Um, and if you've already done some work on TCFD recommendations, you haven't wasted your time, continue on that path. Um, and maybe after this reporting season, I would recommend the next step <coughs> is an IFRS S2 gap analysis. Um, in our corporate reporting insights newsletter that's been published tomorrow, we've done a little bit of a comparison between the TCFD recommendations and IFRS S2 to provide some comfort to you that you're on the right track if you're looking at the TCFD recommendation. So there's training, um, and then we also prepared a checklist um, where, which includes the 11 recommendations and some suggested recommendations that you can look at for 30 June. 
<coughs> the other part is the carbon footprint. And we know that's where we look at the greenhouse gas protocol. We've got a publication explaining that. Um, and I would like to strongly encourage you um, to attend our webinars every month looking at the greenhouse gas protocol. So next week is the second one. It's being presented by Dylan Byrne and myself. Um, and next week we're looking at scope one. How do we measure scope one emissions? Last month we looked at the start and setting organization and operational boundaries. So please register for these webinars. It would really help you to measure carbon footprint and to get ready for disclosures uh, next year as part of IFRS S2, but it's also required currently by TCFD recommendations. Um, coming back to today's agenda, um, Kevin will revisit some key concepts in accounting for convertible notes. Um, and then he'll also look at changing times and changing instruments. Um, and he'll also look at examples of new complexity relating to convertible instruments arising from our changing times. Um, so Kevin's put in quite a bit of time to not just revisit some of these topics, but make it very relevant to what we're seeing in the market today. So Kevin, thank you very much for all that effort you've put in and over to you. Thank, thank you, Aleta. And um, once again, thanks for the introduction. Aleta is going to drive the slides in the background again, and, and I'm going to talk. Um, obviously, um, Aleta will jump in if there's anything she's seeing. But um, one of the reasons why we keep putting this topic in our webinars is because it keeps coming up. We set the topics at the beginning of the of the calendar year, so so the topic that didn't just um, arrive suddenly, um, we 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 generally put it into our schedule of webinars because we know when these topics normally become relevant. And as the letter says, convertible notes um, always arises around about the June year ends and you know into August when entities are, are preparing their financials. But we were surprised this year again, just how topical it was by putting this topic at this moment, because we are seeing um, the emergence of convertible instruments again. And I'm going to say convertible instruments a lot as opposed to convertible notes, because convertible notes is a traditional topic we keep referring to, which is your traditional, call it a convertible in instrument, like a preference share or something like that. Those are, those are the traditional examples that you'll often see in training material where a preference share converts to ordinary shares at some point in the future. But convertible instruments is actually capturing really any instrument that at some point will convert to shares. And we are starting to see that the convertible notes has become a bit broader now, and we're moving to what's called convertible instruments. And the reason why I'm using that term is because other accounting standards may become relevant to the determination. So very topical today. What we'll do today is cover, shall we call it the basics, almost a little bit of a technical training session for the first half, just to remind you of how this works. And then what we'll do at the end, or what I'll let do at the end, is start to show you that those broader instruments that we're starting to see and how those are also driving complexity in the accounting. Um, it's not that the accounting standards have got more complex, it's that the instruments are becoming more complex. And that's what we'll try and cover off a couple of examples today. What I'll do then in terms of starting off is where our resources are. And the reason why is because we've done this topic before. It's actually not the first time we've done a webinar on convertible notes, but it's also not, um, we, we, also, we also have you know, tons of material out there. So the first one is our corporate topic um, um, page. So our BDO's corporate uh, uh, reporting uh, topics page. Um, there's a section for convertible notes um, under the financial instruments presentation um, tab. And let me just say the, the corporate reporting topics page. If you type BDO corporate reporting topics into your browser, it'll be the first one that comes up. Um, and what, what this ex actually has is by topic, we have essentially every accounting standard and all of BDO resources filed by topic. And today's one is the financial instruments presentation tab. There's also a tab there for sustainability reporting. So you can find the sustainability re re reporting material the same way. I've given you a, a link to the top where you can find this. What I've highlighted here is our previous webinars um, on the previous slide that uh, was on there, the webinars. And I've highlighted in red the accounting for convertible notes, which we did 
oh in july 21 but we also did the uh, demystifying financial instruments in december 22 so some of the materials you'll see today um is is a repeat of that at a high level um but the detail and some of the worked examples we've done in the past can be found in those two webinars so if you want to go back and actually do a a real listen to worked examples with work case studies we have those two webinars there and by the way the december 22 um webinar that's on the screen now that was the classic one with myself and etienne host from our cfr advisory um, where we did hedging and a couple of other issues as well and if you remember a letter was away and the webinar failed halfway through and i suddenly wasn't there anymore so if you want to have a bit of comic relief go and have a look at the demisting financial instruments webinar and see how etty and i coped with a webinar infrastructure that wasn't working but then heading to the next page is our actual published resources and the one that i've highlighted at the bottom is our accounting for convertible notes that is our very well known um convertible notes guide um if us in practice why I'm pointing it out is because it's used a lot. It, it comes up a lot because it's actually got a very useful decision tree in it, which I'll be referring to today again. But I do want to point out that it was updated in December 22. So if you've been using the IFRS in practice and it's dated before December 22, you might want to go and get the new guide. There were some amendments in there and some changes in um, examples and so forth to reflect you know changing times and changing views so just make sure you're using the most recent guide which is the december 22 on the next slide i've actually um put a little picture here so you'll be able to spot it and then on the right hand side is the the very famous decision tree um which will help you with classification on convertible notes the big issue with convertible notes at least from the issuer side so the entity who's issuing them is whether you have equity liability or derivative liabilities that's the real big issue with convertible notes and that classification decision drives all the other complexity so for example if you've got a derivative liability in a convertible note you're probably going to need to do um, annual valuations because that will be fair value valuations of the instrument so you'll probably have to get a valuation done um, which normally involves an external value depending on how complex the instrument is. So the big issue, as I said, that drives complexity is the classification of issued convertible notes, derivative liability, liability or equity. And this decision tree is the starting point for a lot of those classifications. And it's in the guide along with worked, worked examples. All right, so let's get into it then. Um, moving on to the key concepts. So this is the this is the technical revision section. So treat this as a as a nice revision of do you understand the concepts? So the key concepts in um, convertible note. First concept is which standard and uh, 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 am I in? Alessa and I always say that if if you get to IFRS complex IFRS issues or accounting issues, the biggest complexity often is deciding which accounting standard you're in. The scoping provisions now there are four four standards that drive this we are dealing with the first one at the top of the right hand column which is financial instruments presentation is32 or in, in australia aasb 132 um, that's the one that deals with the classification of instruments as equity or liability and we'll spend a bit of time there um, but the other standards are still important the ifrs 9 or aasb 9 financial instruments that one deals with classifications of um, other instruments like financial assets, for example, as well as the measurement of instruments. So even, even once you've classified something and decided it's equity or liability, you will then transition, for example, to IFRS 9 to work out how you measure these instruments. And then ultimately you'll end up in a AASB 7 or IFRS uh, 7 for the disclosure of financial instruments and credit risk and all those things. So there's a lot going on here. Um, with um, accounting for financial instruments which is what convertible notes often are you have to identify the instrument understand you know how to classify it, if it's liability or equity or if it's a financial asset you, you're probably going to be under IFRS 9 and then you're going to decide how to measure it initially and ongoing and then disclosure is ultimately where you end up and generally every year you start again go back to the beginning and do it all over again now as i said we'll be focusing on IFRS 
um, financial instruments presentation and if you go to BDO's resources to look for this material you will look under the topic page financial instruments presentation because that's the one that deals with equity and liability classifications but obviously there's other other standards at play yeah. so jumping forward then to our classification I thought I would actually bring this in because convertible notes by their definition we often talk about it from the point of view of the issuing entity so so the entity that issues the instrument but you know someone someone generally holds that instrument as an investment so i thought i would i would at least deal with both sides of the of of, of that ledger today so if you hold the instrument and you have to account for it you'll have a financial asset and you'll have to classify that in some way or form the purpose of this slide is really just to demonstrate that if you are the holder of a financial instrument or a convertible note investment it's most likely going to be at fair value. In fact, it, it, it probably will be at fair value, especially if you have complex um, you know, derivative features and all those, which we'll get to. Generally speaking, you only use amortized costs for your financial assets if you've, if you've got a basic lending arrangement like a loan. Convertible notes by their nature have more features to them. They have conversion features. So the loan or the investment in a liability uh, sorry, in a in a in a in a in a in a loan often can be converted to shares as a form of settlement. And generally speaking, um, if you're the holder of those instruments, you will account for those instruments as a single instrument at fair value. That's the general place you're going to find yourself. Why is that relevant today? Um, in many ways, the accounting but for the holder of the instrument is a lot easier because you don't really have to pull the instrument apart and decide whether you've got equity and liability, you really have an investment in a financial asset and it's generally at fair value. The biggest complexity there is probably needs to be valued every year and often because of the complex nature of, of investments in convertible instruments, you probably have to get a value on an annual basis to value the instrument and those gains or losses will normally go through profit or loss depending on your chosen policy. I'll leave it at there because obviously the bigger part of today is actually going to be the next slide, which is classifying financial liabilities or the financial liability side. So we will, from this point forward, deal mostly with the entity that issues the instruments. And the rule here is also, you're probably going to end up with fair value um, a lot of the time, unless you have a loan uh, or a host loan um, instrument, at which point that'll be at amortized costs. And that is often the biggest issue with convertible notes is, the convertible notes that we traditionally talk about and which I'll talk about in this section of the presentation is those instruments that have a loan, we owe money back to, to the holder, but the conversion feature is the thing that complicates it because instead of paying back the loan or the liability, we settle it in by, by issuing instruments or by issuing equity. And that's where the conversion feature creates complexity. So hopping forward then to what this is all about for the rest of the day is um, the convertible notes issued. The big issue with accounting for convertible notes, and, and Alessia, you can probably click through so we can bring all the components up. There we go. Um, the big issue with um, convertible notes and the issuer is the complexity arises because the instrument is made up of a whole bunch of features or, or components. And the accounting of those instruments, you need to account for the separate components separately. That's where the complexity comes. Now, let's talk about the three traditional types of convertible notes from the issuer's perspective. I'm actually going to start on the, on, on, on the right-hand side here because um, a liability is generally, as it says, it's a liability, and those are your traditional instruments where you take out a loan and you owe the money back, so you have to pay the cash back and that creates a liability. That's your traditional in instrument. With convertible notes, we start to add complexity because one option might be to pay the loan back in cash, liability. The other option might be to settle it instead of in cash by issuing shares. And that conversion feature creates a second component. And that second component is the complexity. That second component is the part that needs to be accounted for often separately. And it creates the two types of um, instruments um, on the left-hand side, which is compound instruments and hybrid financial instruments. Um, so these are the sort of the traditional three. We'll focus on these today. The compound instrument is where you have a liability and an equity component. And what that means is, 
the liability is the host debt instrument. You owe the liability back, or you need to you need to pay them the loan back. But the equity is the feature that is the conversion feature. If this was settled, it was settled in equity, and there's a residual equity instrument. But that equity component isn't always equity. It could be a derivative liability, which is when you get the middle the middle box. Now. The big complexity here is that a lot of organizations still think that if they take out a loan by way of a convertible note, or they issue a loan by way of a convertible note, if there's a conversion feature to it, it has to be equity because they're gonna issue shares. And, and, and that's probably one of the most misunderstood parts of accounting for convertible notes, because even if you issue shares to settle the instrument, it could be a derivative liability depending on on what the terms of those instruments are. So you could actually have just all liability on your balance sheet, even if the even if the outcome of the instrument is that you're gonna settle it with equity. So that's the key thing with, with uh, counting of convertible notes is, do I actually have just a derivative liability, even if that derivative li liability represents the fact that I'm gonna settle in shares? And that is often very difficult for companies to get their heads around because they enter into a convertible note, they issue it, they think that what they're doing is they're really entering into an instrument that'll give that'll ultimately be settled by them issuing shares and they can't understand why they're ending up with this fair value derivative liability on their balance sheet because it doesn't make sense to them. Why isn't it not just all equity? That's the biggest complexity in accounting for these instruments. So let's get into some of the detail then. Um, this diagram, I'll just make reference to it. Um, I'm not going to make, make reference to the diagram in the IFRS in practice. I, I've already mentioned that the, the, the guide that we have in our resources section has this decision tree in it. I just want to point out that the um, decision tree is uh, applied to each component of the instrument because ultimately once you've determined what your instrument is made up of, debt and derivatives and warrants and all these little features in it, you apply the decision to tree to each of them separately because generally speaking, you would account for the different components separately. So if you're using our IFRS in practice guide, you apply the decision tree to the individual components separately. But what that means is that you need to be able to identify those components. And it's one of the more difficult things to do in accounting from convertible notes is how to identify the different features because every feature which is often a separate component needs to be accounted for separately. And often one of the components in a convertible note will be a derivative. What do we mean by a derivative? A derivative really has two sort of key features um, in terms of convertible notes. First thing is a derivative is something where the value of the instrument changes based on some sort of underlying, like a commodity price or a foreign exchange rate or a share price. So if you have an instrument and its value varies based on some underlying variable like a share price, it's probably a derivative. What is an embedded derivative? An embedded derivative is when a derivative that's embedded in a contract changes some of the cash flows of the non-derivative hosts. And, and, and this is the classic example of a convertible note. A convertible note is essentially often made up of two components. The component to repay the cash or the loan, and the component is, uh, which is the equity conversion feature. And what happens is the value of the equity conversion feature changes based on the share price. And depending on the outcome of that conversion feature, whether we settle in shares or not, it will change the cash flows, i.e. whether we actually pay back the loan in cash or not. And that is an embedded derivative. If you have a feature that has a changing value based on, let's say, a share price, and it potentially changes um, the cash flows of the instrument, it, the whole instrument as a whole, you probably have an embedded derivative and you now have, you are now into this complex world of accounting for convertible, um, convertible notes. So moving along then to our next slide is probably to actually deal with the rules. This is maybe the most important slide today. Um, this is on a slide, probably the key concepts in convertible notes and how to account from there for them as an issuer. The first thing is, on the left-hand side, if you as an entity have issued a convertible note and you have a contractual obligation to deliver cash that you cannot avoid, in other words, based on the terms of the contract, you couldn't avoid repaying this loan in cash, 
you probably have a host debt financial liability. So you've got a host contract with a financial liability. That's your traditional liability component. I have to pay the loan back and I can't avoid paying the cash. However, if you could settle it in shares on the right hand side of the screen, you also then have an equity component possibly or a derivative liability component possibly being the conversion feature. And that conversion feature has to be classified as equity only in two scenarios. This part on the right hand side is the part that companies often struggle with because they think as long as this is settled in equity shares, it must be equity in the accounting. And that's not true. It's only equity under two scenarios. One is it's a non-derivative itself that includes no contractual obligation to deliver a variable number of shares. Now, this is where we get into these concepts of derivatives and variable number of shares. What this first requirement is trying to do is trying to decide whether, whether you actually have an instrument that um, you are treating your shares as, as a proxy for cash. In other words, if the conversion feature really will just be used to deliver as many shares to the holder to settle the loan, it's probably all just liability because you're treating your shares as a proxy for cash. That's what the first one is trying, trying to do. The second one being the derivative one is if you have a derivative, in other words, the conversion features value changes because of an underlying variable like the share price, you can only classify it as equity if it will result in a fixed number of shares for a fixed amount of cash. And the easiest example of this one is you issue into a convertible note and the convertible note agreement says something like, you've got to pay, pay back the cash or if not, you can issue a thousand shares, a fixed number of shares. What's actually happening there is you've issued a derivative and because it's a fixed number of shares, it's almost like you've agreed to actually just issue the fixed number of shares later for cash. That is an equity component, the so-called fix or fix rules. Let's do a couple of examples because this is a hard thing to do. The purpose of today is not to make you an expert out of this, but it's actually just to kind of point out some of the key complexities in convertible notes. So I think on this slide, there's three examples um, or three, three, um, three sort of high level examples. The first one is a compound financial instrument. I want to say we always start with this in, in our training material when we, we're doing these presentations because the traditional compound financial instrument is the traditional training example that everyone learns from the moment they hit university and they start to do accounting. They learn how to do compound financial instruments because it's a good example of I've got an instrument, it's got two features, two separate components. One of them is a debt component, one of them is a conversion feature and the debt component is a liability and the and, and, and the equity conversion feature is equity on the accounting side, that's a compound instrument. The example here is you have a loan, you have a li liability component, in other words, you have to pay the liability plus interest and pay the cash back at maturity, that's your liability component. And the equity component is a conversion feature, you could settle that liability in ordinary shares, but it'll only be equity if it meets one of the, the two previous rules on the previous page. And that means that the number of shares has to be fixed. Then it can be equity. That part is often missed by organizations. The conversion feature doesn't just mean issue shares. The conversion feature must be a derivative that is converted into a fixed number of ordinary shares, like a stated value, a thousand shares or 10,000 shares. And then it is your compound financial instrument. Then it has an equity. Getting to the hybrid, this is the one that often results in practice because the hybrid financial is if you take a convertible note and instead of actually just being a straight, you have 1,000 shares at the end to settle it, the amount of the shares is driven by some other type of variability. And the traditional one we are seeing a lot of is some sort of volume weighted basis, like a VWAP or something that actually changed the number of shares. So in this example, a convertible note gives you an option to receive the principal or to convert the note into shares based on a share price. There's your derivative. But the weighted average share price also makes the number of shares vary. That will make this a hybrid financial instrument. And what you're going to end up here with is a liability and a derivative liability. I think this is probably, I'll pause at this point because 
this is the point of the of of today's um, webinar is to remind you that the moment you start to have complex arrangements where the number of shares starts to vary on some sort of basis or, or, or mechanism, you're probably not going to have an equity component there. You're probably going to have a derivative liability. And the best way to think about it is to actually apply the concept of are the holders of these convertible notes in a better or worse position than other shareholders because of this instrument? Because if if the amount of shares that they could get puts them into a different position to other ordinary shareholders, and often it put often they're in a better position than other shareholders, it probably means that 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 component is a derivative liability. That's just a good rule of thumb because what it's actually doing, it's actually trying to say is that these holders could get shares instead of cash settlement under scenarios that are actually potentially more favourable to them that's your derivative liability. So the fact that shares are being issued to settle this doesn't mean it's equity. It's whether those shares are actually favorable in some way or form to the holders, derivative, and they're gonna be settled in some sort of variable way. The, the VWAP or the weighted average price of the shares is what makes this particular example a derivative liability because it's putting these holders in a better position or worse position relative to other shareholders, the number of shares they're going to get is variable. That's probably the takeaway today is these are the complex instruments you want to look out for. The last example then is just liability. And um, I mean, we probably should have started with this one, but this is your traditional liability where you actually have a debt instrument, you have a specific coupon and you have to repay it at maturity this will be your traditional liability. We're gonna do on the next slide, these examples again, with slightly slight variations just to show how it works. So this is still a bit of a technical update for you. Um, so I've, 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 I've put them down, slight variations to the examples, but essentially following the same mechanism. What I'm gonna do is go down the right-hand side diagram. So the blue, that's the example and show you how you get to the answer. This is a straight entity A has to repay a currency unit of a thousand on maturity. That is just a contractual obligation to pay cash. That's what we call a debt instrument. It's a liability. You have a loan. You got to pay, you got to repay it at the at, at the end. The next one down, we change it slightly and we say on maturity, the note holder has the option to convert the note into a variable number of equity um, instruments of entity A based on their quoted market price. Now this is a bit of a tricksy one because there's clearly a conversion feature here. So we've got the host debt instrument, but we've also got the option of, of converting the instrument at settlement into shares by issuing shares to settlement, so a convertible note. The, the first thing is we have to look at here is do we have a derivative um, to then try and understand whether we meet the equity classification rules. So do we have a derivative here? Well, actually not. And we've put this one in the block at the top so you can read this one. Why? Because yes, we're issuing a variable number of shares, but we're actually issuing only as, as many shares based on the market price to settle the face value of the loan. This is not a derivative because the value isn't changing. The, the holder, if he uses this conversion option, will get as many shares as equals $1,000 on or 1,000 currency units on settlement. The fact that it's not a derivative means we actually have to evaluate this about what's actually happening on substance. The non-derivative and the fact that we're issuing a variable number of shares here means this can't be equity because what's actually happening is we're just using our shares as currency to settle the liability. So the entire instrument is still a liability and we account for it as such. So a bit of a tricksy one. And then the last one, we change it again slightly and say on maturity, Entity A may repay $1,000 or issue $10,000 of its own shares, the value of which is 25,000 currency units at inception. Another one I've thrown in to be tricksy because clearly there's a conversion feature. So two, two features, we've got the host debt loan of 1,000, we have to settle it. But Entity A has the choice now to repay either the 1,000 or issue 10,000 of its own shares, the value of which is $25,000 at inception. Now this one is a tricksy one as well, why? Because actually if you look at it and you stand back, you're gonna say, why would anybody pay this back 
through the shares? Why would entity A choose to issue the shares in this scenario? Because why would he pay a thousand dollar loan back with twenty-five thousand dollars worth of of shares? This type of instrument is actually included in today's presentation because it's one we're starting to see a lot of. These types of clauses are non-genuine or they, they clearly raise eyebrows about why would anybody actually do this. Entity A is unlikely likely to actually ever issue the shares as repayment because it's not, in, it's, it's not in its economic interest to do so. So this is an example of an instrument that has a non-genuine feature in it because the entity is clearly going to be incentivized to pay $1,000. That is its economic interest is find the money to repay the $1,000, never issue the shares. So this one here is actually all going to be liability too. And it introduces one of the key components of today's presentation is we are starting to see a massive uptick in entities entering into convertible instruments that actually contain features that are probably not genuine, that are actually putting entities into a situation where they have to or most likely have to go down one or another option in, in the agreement because one of the features is so economically not genuine, it's never going to happen. That is probably one of the points I'd like you to take out of today's presentation is if you are issuing these instruments, they often happen when the party that's issuing the instrument is actually getting the terms of the contract from the holder. So this often happens in, I want to say, venture capitalism or where you're actually looking for finance overseas, maybe in the US, you're trying to raise funds because you can't raise funds in Australia. So you're looking for, for, for debt elsewhere and you're getting it from organizations who are actually driving the negotiation. They're happy to invest in your company, let's say, um, but they're driving the terms of the instruments. They will often negotiate really interesting um, um, terms that put the entity in a situation that they have to actually go down a path one way or another and you need to start to understand whether those those, those terms are driving a particular outcome and might even be creating non-genuine terms in the instrument and you'd have to have a look at that in terms of the accounting. I'll leave it at, at, at that um, to, to jump forward um, to do the last one in the interest of time and say this is a nice example of another one we're seeing a lot of late, lately, which is when we have convertible notes, um, which have volume weighted or VWAPs. We've actually seen um, a lot of VWAPs occur. Now VWAPs probably happen mostly in entities that are listed because you've got a trading market where there's a volume weighted average price, but there can be variations of VWAPs for unlisted entities. What you're looking for here is some sort of um, weighted price that changes the number of shares but the one we often use to demonstrate the concept is a VWAP, a five-day volume, volume weighted average price. Um, so we have a note holder option to convert you know, to settle the thousand dollars based on the VWAP. The conversion feature is clearly a derivative because it, it's, it's, uh, um, its value changes based on the underlying share price and the VWAP makes the number of shares not fixed it means that there's a variable number of shares. So it cannot pass the fix for fix test to be equity. This is an example of a derivative liability separate from the host debt. And this derivative would have to be revalued on an ongoing basis. So those are the traditional examples we see. Um, I think we've covered the base concepts. Why is this important on our next slide? It's because one, if you, um, don't get the debt classification right at the outset, you'll get the accounting wrong. One is you only ever going to have an equity feature if you pass one of those, those rules, a fixed for fixed test, if the equity conversion feature is a derivative um, or a non-derivative that has no variable number of shares included. Otherwise, everything is going to be some variation of a liability or a derivative liability. What's the difference here? If you do have an equity component, the way you will actually recognize the instrument initially at fair value is to recognize the host debt instrument first and the residual is equity. Whereas if you don't have an equity instrument, you will actually have to do a different type of re initial recognition um, where you will actually have to recognize the liability and some sort of derivative liability which will have to be fair value on an ongoing basis. And as you can probably jump through to the bottom side of that, the big takeaway on this one is when you have an equity component, 
um, it can only only arise in a compound instrument and if it does arise in a compound instrument you don't revalue the equity on an ongoing subsequent measurement basis and if you don't have an equity component and you have a derivative for liability for example there you will have to subsequently measure the derivative liability on an ongoing basis and it'll obviously all be in liability with no equity that is why it's so important to get this uh, debt equity classification um, correct all right let's move to complexity Alessa, do you have any comments to this point or are you happy for us to keep going kevin my only comment is i really like the way you've put this together i know you've looked at a lot of previous work we've done and it's it's a it's a different presentation and i'm finding it really interesting and useful so thank you for that i'm enjoying it you, you just Good. push ahead <laughs> all right let's go to increasing complexity this is the this is the 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 the, the, the takeaway crux of today what are we seeing out there that is actually adding complexity to the accounting of convertible notes? As time changes, we are seeing more and more, I want to say, exotic features. They're actually not exotic features. We see them all the time, but we're seeing more and more of them, especially in private, private companies that are looking for finance, and especially if that's finance overseas, or if you're looking for this finance from venture capitalists, they are starting to insist that the instrument itself has more features that protect the holder that's providing the finance as opposed to the company that's issuing the instrument. Now, as I said, th these type of features exist. They've been around for a long time, but more and more we're seeing that they are appearing in contracts. Some of the types of features we're seeing that change the complexity or change the assessments on whether you've got debt or equity or, or derivative liabilities are what we call contingently convertible instruments. So instruments that only convert on the outcome of a particular trigger event. And that trigger event um, is dependent then on whether um, the issuer of a holder can control the trigger, of, trigger event. Now the one that would we often see is the ability of an entity to actually successfully get up an IPO is the one that we used to see. In fact, two or three years ago, everything was driven on the outcome of a successful IPO. IPOs died a natural death at the end of last year because the economic uh, conditions changed and, the, and, 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 and times in the, the world changed, the market became a bit flack, IPOs died a little bit. And so we're not seeing so many IPOs anymore, but we are seeing the nature of those contingent convertible trigger events change from a successful IPO to perhaps starting an IPO process. The ability to start an IPO process and the ability to actually get to a successful IPO are two different events and they are actually two different control events which are actually under different parties controls. The other one we're seeing is not so much getting a successful IPO off the ground or actually starting an IPO, but actually just another round of financing. So you might have a scenario where you raise funds with a convertible note, let's say a series B, and then a series C raise happens a couple of months later. And the success or otherwise of that, of that next um, finance event often triggers an outcome in the contingent of the convertible note. We're seeing more and more of those starting to trickle in. And, and the party who's able to control that trigger event isn't always the issuing company. And especially if the if someone else can control the, the outcome of the trigger event, that could change your classification from equity to liability. In fact, rule of thumb, if you've got a trigger of event that somebody else controls that's outside your control as, a, as an issuing company I want to say the chances change dramatically that you've probably got a liability at that point um, so that's one we're seeing a lot of and you want to just make sure that you understand the finer details of what's the trigger event and who controls it I think my takeaway on contingent um, events is probably to be really clear in the convertible instrument on on what the trigger event is because you don't want to go into a convertible note with a vague event like IPO. Because what, what about an IPO? Starting an IPO, getting an IPO successful off the ground, the, the, the actual point at which an IPO is successful, whether it be starting it or ending it, is actually quite important to those types of instruments. So you want to be really clear in your instrument about what you mean by IPO or issue or another round and then who controls it. 
The other one is the down round features and the anti-dilutive VWAPs again. Now, the down round feature is also nothing that's new. This is the, this is a sort of term um, that's normally included in a convertible instrument that tries to adjust the conversion ratio depending on whether there's another issue um, later on at less than the conversion price. So this kind of comes back to you know series A, B, C, and D uh, capital raises, where you might have uh, an instrument, a convertible note that's issued, and the, the, the agreement will say something like, um, if another issue of, uh, of an instrument happens or another capital raise or finance raise happened, if that is at a price lower than the conversion price in, in, in the convertible note agreement, we adjust the conversion ratios. Those, those clauses by definition are trying to retain relative rights of the various parties so that no one is hard done by a subsequent issue at a lower price. It's trying to maintain relative rights so that the relative um, existing shareholders as well as the convertible um, instrument holders, their relative rights are maintained. But what has often happened, especially in the changing times we're in now, is that the down round feature doesn't just protect everybody's right in equal proportion. What it actually does sometimes is it favours the convertible note holder in some way so that their relative rights are more favourable than everybody else's. Those types of instruments are starting to make an appearance and it's often driven by money coming in from overseas or venture capitalists who are able to control the negotiation of, of, of these types of convertible instruments. And they often put down round features or variations in these types of uh, conversion ratios that actually favor them in themselves in certain scenarios. So really the convertible hold node actually ends up in a better position if there's a subsequent change in the conversion ratio because of a subsequent issue those can, can lead to derivative liabilities really quickly. And you want to just be aware of those clauses. They are protective in nature often, but the protective nature often favors somebody substantially if it actually happens. And that substantive nature where somebody is substantially benefited means the protective clause becomes really relevant to the assessment of whether you've actually got a derivative liability or not. And then finally, the other one is the VWAP, which I actually think I will talk to on the next slide, Aleta. Um, the VWAP and the down round feature, something we started to see, I think Aleta probably seen this a bit more than I have, um, but we're starting to see VWAPs appear in down round calculations. So instead of it just being a down round calculation, the down round calculation actually has a VWAP, VWAP component to it as well. But we're also starting to see VWAPs, and I'm gonna just head to the bottom of the slide. We're starting to see a lot of convertible notes where the VWAP isn't a traditional five day average VWAP just before a conversion. We're starting to think, see things like 10 day, 30 day VWAP calculations. Now those are, they're not unusual, but we're seeing more and more of them. And that clearly introduces some sort of variability more than just the intended five day weighted average um, which normally happens bef before an instrument. Something else is going on here, especially if those VWAP calculations extend back more than 10 and 30, 30 days. There's a lot of reasons why a VWAP uh, calculation in a conversion feature might extend 30 days back, especially if the instrument's not, 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 not highly traded, but you really have to look at these and saying, what are they trying to do here? And once again, is somebody's right more beneficial than another shareholders if that feature triggers. And that's the key you come back to is, what are these various clauses trying to do? Are they trying to put everybody's, everybody being the option holder as well as the other shareholders rights in equal proportion? Or is somebody beneficially favored significantly if that particular fe feature triggers? Because that can drive the assessment of whether you've got a liability or an equity. So I'll leave it at that. And, and, and just say to keep your eyes open. Last one on this side, I think I've covered all of these, but the one at the bottom is functional currency. Um, I don't know what you've seen on your side of that, but in Sydney, more and more we look, we're seeing clients who are looking for funding in countries other than Australia. So they're looking outside of Australia's borders. Um, sometimes that's just better cost of debt. Sometimes they actually just can find funding because they can't find it locally. But what it does is you've got a foreign currency loan, which is not the same as the functional currency of the entity in terms of accounting. And that will have features that will make it fail the equity classification 
because it introduces a derivative because the instrument and the conversion features are actually subject to functional cur to currency fluctuations. So you've got a, f a currency derivative that's lurking inside a convertible note, and that changes the number of shares that have to be issued on conversion, and that probably means you have an embedded derivative liability. Also not new, but just we're seeing more of them. So just keep your eye um, open for that. All right. Um, what I'll do then is just summarize things to 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 remember. I'll go through this one quickly. I'll really just actually focus on two blocks on this block. One is the top left hand side. If the instrument that you have in the conversion feature is not putting the holder in the same position as the other equity instrument holders, there's something going on. That probably means you've got something to really focus on. Um, so this is where these uh, dilutive features and so forth come in. Relative rights of shareholders or holders of instruments need to be maintained in order for you to have something like an equity classification. If relative rights aren't being maintained, you probably got something more complex and probably something more in the lines of a derivative or derivative liability. Um, the other thing to um, actually just focus on is just because you're issuing shares to settle a convertible note doesn't mean you have equity. And that's at the bottom right hand side of, of the slide. So just bear that in mind. Um, and then finally, um, in the top right hand corner, we talk about um, non genuine features. Instruments are classified based on their rights, they're not based on what an entity is economically compelled to do unless those instruments aren't genuine. And we are starting to see lots of complex instruments emerge which have features which are not genuine because there's no possibility it's ever going to happen and that's often driven when the holder of the instrument is driving the negotiations they're trying to force an outcome through the through the instrument and it often leads to a particular type of accounting so just bear that in mind and then we will do changing times and changing terms i've got two examples here um and these are the these are two types of instruments that we're seeing a lot of. Also not new, but also becoming real features across the board. Entities are bringing, bringing them to us by way of their audits, or they're coming to us and saying what to do with this. Um, and the one that, that is most common, which I've seen quite a lot of in the last six months, um, like I said, not new, but, 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 but certainly raising its head more, more broadly, is where entities are actually issuing shares or convertible instruments to their customers as part of a customer arrangement. So I'll give you an example. Company sells a good to customer, pretty standard there, but they attach to the agreement the issue of a number of options to the customers. And those options can vest at some point in the future based on either the length of contract. The one I see a lot of, it's an incentive for the customer to actually keep buying more product. So the more product the customer buys, the more options they get or the more instruments they get. And then those options can be converted to shares at a later date, um, um, similar to an employee share, share incentive scheme, but clearly we're not dealing with employees, we're dealing with customers. So the complexity here is, one is these are starting to happen a lot. We really are seeing a lot of them um, arise. Here's the complexity on the next slide is how to account for these things. Because there's three obvious places to start and it's not clear depending on the facts and circumstances which one to go to first. The first question on the left hand side is, is this just a share based payment similar to an employee share scheme? Now what we mean by those is, um, we expense something and credit equity and we do some sort of valuation similar to an ESOP. That's one alternative. And because it feels like an option scheme, buy more, get more, and then you can convert these later on, it feels like a share-based payment. But it's actually not with a supplier per se, it's with a customer. So heading to the far right-hand side is, are we just dealing with a payment to a customer to which the revenue standard applies? If you read the revenue standard IFRS 15, it'll talk about payments to customers and it'll talk about deducting those pay payments to customers from revenue. So that's another alternative or some other combination in between, or is this just once again, a straight instrument to which the equity liability classification applies. Now, that would be go to SSP 132, similar to the convertible note guidance we've been talking about during this webinar. 
The answer isn't that clear, or it is clear in some places, and there is some complexity here, but these are the issues you need to grapple with. I'm not going to give a straight answer today on the webinar because all of these are facts and circumstances dependent. Some of the answers are more easy than others, depending on when you get into the agreements, but the complexity here is convertible instrument of sort that's linked to a customer arrangement, so it's not quite linked to a traditional issue of finance, uh, uh, like a normal convertible note, but clearly the instrument converts to shares at some point in the future, and the existence of the customer relations relationship starts to muddy the water a bit, about which standard are you in? So keep your eye out for that, and I'd say if, you, if you're not sure where to go with that, give us, give us a call to one of our, one of our um, advisory partners on this, and then this one is just for a letter. I decided to put this one in because sustainability linked, um, ESG linked bonds. We are definitely seeing an uptick in ESG linked bonds. Um, the traditional answer or the traditional fact pattern is something along the lines of the fact pattern on screen. So you've got a traditional convertible note that's gonna con either be repaid or converted to shares, but in order to incentivize the entity to move forward with its ESG credentials, some sort of feature is included there, such as if you don't meet an ESG criteria, you've got a penalty amount, or you might have a variation to the interest or some sort of variation to the basis point adjustments to the interest if you don't meet your ESG criteria, or if the entity can settle early to avoid paying a penalty if they don't meet the ESG criteria. All of these are variations on a theme, which is pretty much more and more we're seeing ESG linked criteria embedded in convertible notes. And those criteria drive outcomes like whether the entity pays early, like whether the entity converts, like whether the entity pays more or less interest, and then that'll have a flow on effect about maybe the number of shares that are ultimately issues varies based on whether the entity meets the, its ESG criteria. I want to say it was about 18 months ago we started to talk about this and I remember thinking at the time, oh, it'll be a while since these become mainstream, but I've been surprised at how quickly these ESG linked convertible notes have flowed through to, shall I call it, a broad base of customers. Please be aware if you are entering into convertible notes that have these ESG linked features because they need to be part of your assessment. How do they affect the assessment, which is on the next slide? Well, it's still going to be the traditional You've got to separate your instrument into components and you have to evaluate each component separately. And the components are, you're either gonna have a compound instrument, a hybrid instrument or a liability. But the complexity comes in, in how do you assess those components and how does it change whether you've got derivative liabilities or whether you've got penalty interest that is closely related to the host instrument. All those complexities trigger because the concepts in the accounting standards are principle based. So you have to apply the ESG link um, complexity to the existing literature on how to essentially classify these um, components. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, Letta, do you want to make any comments on the ESG link components that you've seen out there? Um, Kevin, I would say the only thing that I would add is that um, more and more of our clients are applying for ESG link loans in various forms and that um, financial institutions are grappling with to what ESG measures should we link the loans because it has to be a realistic within the control of the entity um, and then also um, if these uh, customers <clears throat> get loans that are linked to ESG metrics um, we assess it and we set it as a financial institution up front but what kind of reporting would then be required over time to make sure that they continue to qualify um, for the lower interest rates, et cetera. Absolutely. And then obviously, as you say, also the, con the conversion features, et cetera, linked to performance. So it's just another kind of performance aspect. It's not linked to share price or linked to interest rates, but potentially linked to some kind of ESG metrics. Absolutely. And, and those really drives, those drive things like materiality assessments. I, yeah. I, if you're working, if you're working with a bank, and I, I did actually have the, the fortune of, of, of meeting with um, uh, an individual from one of the big banks last week to speak about this. It just came up in conversation, um, and 
the topic was presented that if the bank is working with you to determine what your metrics are and what's achievable and what's relevant in a way what you're actually doing is creating your you're doing a materiality assessment because if it's important to you for your financing it's clearly important for your materiality assessment when you start to get to you know reporting and tcfd and so forth um so just something to bear in mind i think a letter i'll call it at that point um and just uh, we can wrap up I, i'm happy if a letter you want to take the assistance part of this and um mm -hmm. i'll say thank you very much I, Kevin, thank you very much. Really interesting um, presentation. It's a really difficult topic when we do this training internally in BDO. It's often a day training session to look at all the complexity and to reduce it to an hour. You've done an, a great job. And also we've presented on this previously on the webinars, but you've managed to come with a different angle. Um, so thank you for that. And I, I'm sure that our attendees and clients have really enjoyed that. Um, then if you look um, at you know do you need assistance um, we ended up with ESG linked uh, instruments so I thought let's start with sustainability services um, the five core services that we provide would be helping you measure your footprint carbon footprint then come up with a decarbonization strategy <coughs> assist with sustainability reporting whether it's in your annual report then um, or a separate report, as well as a strategy um, and the materiality assessment, a roadmap, and then finally, do you need assurance? And interesting, Kevin, I'm, I'm seeing more and more requests uh, for BDO uh, to provide assurance over carbon footprint and sustainability reporting, and I've got a number of proposals due actually on Friday uh, on that aspect. Um, for Kevin and I and the IFRS and corporate reporting team, um, can we help you with your carbon footprint or to get started, develop a roadmap, um, attend our webinars? Can we help with those TCFD disclosures? Look at our TCFD checklist, our training. But if you need more assistance, please contact us. Um, tomorrow, the August edition of Corporate Reporting Insights is coming out. Um, and except for one article, each and every article is around sustainability around TCFD disclosures, about IFRS S2 compared to TCFD, where do you put the disclosures, asset focus areas, it's all about sustainability reporting. And there is one IFRS article on the tax, um, the pillar two tax requirements. Um, so that is there. Uh, you can obviously register for corporate reporting insights that look after sustainability and IFRS, but there's also sustainability insights. But we've got our webinar series um, around ESG, which is in the second year, but for the next five months, it's absolutely just focused on carbon accounting. Um, and the other thing is we're currently develop, developing an a online e-learning course around carbon accounting, which will also be available later in the year. Um, and that will be free, similar to the TCFD course, which is free. Um, and on our website, a lot of great information um, if you want to speak to us about um, convertible notes or any other IFRS matters, these are our six uh, partners and, and leaders nationally, but there's also a big broader team that would be able to help you. And if you specifically want to speak to us around sustainability, please feel free to reach out. As you can see, Kevin and I play a role across sustainability and normal IFRS and corporate reporting. An interesting how the two worlds are more and more colliding our sustainability worlds with our normal IFRS world and it's colliding in mandatory reporting in the annual reports um, and I've also seen that more and more the roles of sustainability um, the chief sustainability officer and that of the CFO are colliding at our clients and a lot of the projects and the work we're doing are joint projects by sustainability and finance um, so thank you for the webinar. Thank you, Kevin. I hope you have a great day. Uh, I hope we speak to you next week in our sustainability webinar. Otherwise, we'll see you in September um, when we look at IFRS again. So thank you very much. Have a great thank day. You. Bye.